let's start with that. Why did you choose to? I mean, I uh, you said you had your Instagram account and then you didn't use it. Why? Why are you not that present in social media? Uh, I guess that's, that's probably a, de- a, 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 de- a deeper question than it needs to be. Really, I just yeah, never, never really, never really created an account. To be honest, I think maybe I set one up years ago, but yeah, never, okay. never really got involved in it. Because uh, I, I can, I've seen that you're pretty active on Twitter. Yeah, I've just, I guess, I don't know, maybe that's showing my age a little bit. I don't feel that old, but that was kind of what, what yeah, the, the medium of choice when uh, when I was sort of, yeah, in my, in my, in my teens, um, when I was still playing tennis and, yeah, just kind of stuck with that ever since. Okay. Um, how, how has your day been? How does um, a day in your life look like now, let's say, compared to when you used to be competing? Uh, very different to then. Um, obviously now, kind of uh, confined to my living room, really. Unfortunately, um, yes, I've been working from home for for almost a year now, and I think that will probably continue for for a while yet. Um, yeah, have, having my son around as well. He's, he's four years old. He's off. Uh, he's off nursery at the moment as well because uh, that's closed. Um, mm-hmm. It's, yeah, it's a, bit, a bit of a challenge while I'm working, but yeah, it's a it's a good fun. What are you working at the moment? Um, I work for Santander, um, mm-hmm. corporate and commercial bank. So I, I've been there for almost three years now, which is which has flown by. Um, so mm-hmm. yeah, I work as a, a relationship director on the on the education team. Um, and yeah. how's it been to be at home for this long and working from home? I guess it's nice to have your uh, to be there to actually see your son, you know, like growing up and doing the thing, all the little adjustment they say to life but how's it been work-wise and yeah it's, it's really nice obviously I get to spend a lot more time with him I've got two dogs as well so I get to spend a lot more time with them and, and go for walks and stuff like that which you know ordinarily it's uh yeah don't, don't necessarily have the time for so from that side of things it's, it's great actually and I think it's definitely given a lot of people are much better work-life balance, but also it's blurred the line a little bit between when you're working and when you're not working, which is a little bit mm-hmm. strange, you know, and whereas before there's a definitive moment when you leave the office and kind of, you know, you might be on your phone, but you very rarely would open your laptop. Whereas now it's just a kind of bit of a, a, bit of a blurred line. Really. If I need to finish mm-hmm. something off, I'll go and do it maybe at the eight to nine o'clock at night rather than doing it, you know, during the day. So I guess it's, it has its positives and its negatives. Yeah, I think people have, have been saying that they have been working more actually during the lockdowns and just during this whole year than they would normally do. Yeah, I, I don't know whether I've maybe worked more. I think it's probably about the same amount, but just kind of be yeah, at very different hours, I guess, mm-hmm. which which is like, yeah, I think a, a good thing. But I guess the, the happy medium is, is somewhere in the middle where you can go in a couple of days a week and then spend the rest of the time at home. Mm-hmm. Well, now let's say learning what you do now, what would you, would you say that this is who Holly Golding is or um because you know we know you as the former junior u.s open champion and number one uh, junior british player so as a tennis player uh, some people know you as a coach as well so who do you identify with more uh probably a bit of everything really i mean obviously tennis is a is a massive part of my life so so that just kind of doesn't doesn't go away as, as soon as i stop sort of doing it as a job um I think initially when I stopped playing, I'd given a lot of my life to tennis and kind of, yeah, almost completely switched off from it. And then over time, I've sort of, yeah, come back into it a little bit more. And, and now I think I was also kind of quite keen when I first sort of moved into a, into a different world um, to kind of reinvent myself. And I didn't want to be known as, as the guy who plays tennis, but I soon kind of realized that actually that's something that sort of differentiates you from, from the, your average person in, in, in the sort of line of work I'm in now. So I actually kind of, yeah, I learned to embrace that a little bit more. Do you think it has helped you, the fact that you were a tennis player, like you've been a tennis player very at a very high level in your workplace, let's say, in your career? Yeah, for, for sure, 100%. What, what, what how, how I mean, uh, pr- I probably, yeah, I mean, to be honest, I probably wouldn't have got the job that I did without my tennis background, so I... Um, yeah, I got placed into the company by a recruitment agency that places uh, former athletes into sort of financial mm-hmm. services roles. So, I mean, that, you know, primarily was one of the reasons why I guess uh, I got the job in the first place. Um, but but also, if you look at kind of the track record of, um, you know, a lot of the people that have been placed, you know, they're, they're 
the, it kind of the, the recruitment agency exists for a reason and i think you know there's a lot of skills that that sport you know not just tennis but you know a, a multitude of different sports gives you and sometimes you know without necessarily even knowing that you're acquiring those skills in terms of you know just hard work and, and kind of dedication to the cause i think is you know something which which stands in good stead has this or like have you always had this side of you that wanted to explore something else let's say apart from tennis or were you strictly focused on tennis for a very long time and then you just kind of there was a switch no i think i always had kind of interests and in, in hobbies outside of tennis um i wouldn't say any more or any less than any other tennis player but you know i was always kind of aware of what was going on in the world and when i kind of uh, you know, I realized that kind of tennis wasn't for me. I didn't necessarily have a, you know, a definitive plan as to where I wanted to go next, but I kind of had a, yeah, a, a view that sort of finance was sort of where I wanted to end up because I think I was fairly good with numbers as a child and just kind of thought, yeah, that, that I'd, I'd quite like to try that. So, mm -hmm. Do you, how, when did you get to that point when you realized tennis is not for you anymore? Or how did you get? at that point because I, I like I've told you I, I've read about that a little bit and it just felt like at the time it was a little bit too much happening too much pressure but apart from that were, were there other stuff that made you say stop uh, I don't think there was ever kind of one definitive moment where uh, yeah I thought, thought right this is the moment where I'm, I'm, I'm stopping it was kind of a, a gradual progression and, and I think sort of the, the last few tournaments that I ended up playing were sort of the straw that broke the camel's back in yeah not a couple of not great places and you know wasn't particularly playing very well and that just kind of yeah it was a sort of the end of the road um but I'd kind of had those those sort of feelings for a while I think once it became more of a job rather than you know as a, as a junior I guess you don't think of it as, as a job and this is my career you you just kind of go along with it um and yeah once it became a job for me and and the kind of the traveling ramped up and I guess yeah the, the responsibilities as, as well that was kind of when I realized that yeah this wasn't for me what do you mean in terms of it being a job, just like the amount of hours that you put in or what, what was it? I think just the, the, the kind of realization that, that this is my career now. I think you're putting in those, those hours as a kid and you almost don't notice that you're putting them in. I think as mm -hmm. you start to get older, you become more aware of the choices that you make and, and the decisions that you're making and you know, how that's going to outcome the, how that's going to affect the outcome of, of, of your life and, and where that kind of leads and, and you know, what, what type of life you have. And I think once I started to become, uh, you know, aware of, um, not necessarily things I was missing out on, but but things that tennis maybe doesn't allow you to have. I, I, that was kind of when I realised. Like what? Just, I guess for me, it was always the st stability of life. Um, you know, knowing where you're going to be from, from one day to the next. In tennis, that's, that's really hard. You know, if you're travelling 35, 40 weeks a year mm -hmm. and you're kind of constantly under the microscope and, and you, yeah, it, 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 there's a, an element of responsibility that comes with that as well. Um, and yeah, just kind of yeah, especially the kind of the the, the traveling part and not knowing where you're going to be one one week to the next. That was really mm -hmm. what I didn't like. So you just felt like you needed more stability in your in your life at that point, or just going forwards, basically. Yeah, but basically, and I'd kind of yeah, sort of fallen out of love with tennis. I think I, I dedicated so much of my life to that point to tennis that it was just kind of you know enough is enough, and I, I kind of need to reassess my options. And then as I kind of ventured out into the normal world, I guess, um, I kind of realized that, yeah, I actually really wasn't missing it very much. Uh, what was the reaction around you to that decision? Did you, were you, did people support it or did they judge you? Yeah, I think there was definitely an element of the, of the latter. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm also aware of, of what I was kind of giving up on as well. And, and, you know, i wasn't a bad tennis player by any stretch and there definitely was a, a career there for me if that was what I wanted but I was becoming increasingly kind of un unhappy and, and you know I knew deep down that, that this really wasn't what I wanted and so a lot of people you know didn't agree with that decision and probably still don't and probably still think you know why would you make that type of decision given you know given the opportunity that I had but uh, you know I guess uh, I've always been my own man and, and I don't really yeah, uh, definitely don't regret the decision at all. So you're in a happy place then? Yes, I'm happy a much happier place than I was yeah, than I was at the time. Okay. That's good. Good. What was your what's your first memory of being on like or with regards to tennis? 
the first thing that you remember? Um, my mum my was a tennis coach, um, so I was kind of growing up on a, on a tennis court um, and, and she used to coach at a, a club called the Vanderbilt, which was um, in Shepherd's Bush where Westfields used to be. Um, and I used to remember that the courts were always kind of in a, in a line rather than being side to side. Um, and I had this little like toy car that I would drive up and down the course <laughs> and kind of jump out on one court and join in a lesson for 10 minutes and then go join another court. So, yeah, that was kind of my, my earliest memory. Did your mom want you to do this or was it just a, you know, a matter of circumstance and you just liked it? Yeah, I think a combination of uh, of both. I think she probably she's she's a fairly good tennis coach, so she probably recognised that, that that I had a kind of a natural aptitude for for, for tennis, and uh, and as she was a pretty good coach and was kind of coaching me, I sort of got better and better. And then I think she, you know, she like any kind of I guess responsible parent, she she saw an opportunity for me, and and she 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 pushed me in that direction for sure. But. Yeah, she she kept. Uh, thankfully, she she kept me involved in other things as well, so I did have stuff to fall back on. How was it like having a parent that is a coach and that actually understands what goes into you becoming the tennis player that you were and you you got to that level? How was the relationship like? I think it's it's a double edged sword. I don't think I probably would have got to the level of tennis that I got to if I didn't kind of have the knowledge that my mum had behind me. But then at the same time, where there were maybe decisions that she maybe thought that she knew the <laughs> the answer better than perhaps my coach at the time or something like that, I think she she struggled to let go, which is you know understandable because she also you know as much as I made huge sacrifices for my tennis, she she made them as well. Um, and so she definitely had more than a vested interest in in my kind of career, and and so, yeah, I think, I, yeah, it's a, it's a double edged sword because I probably wouldn't have got as far as I did without it. But at the same time, it, it can become a, it can become a problem. Are you going to encourage your child to follow the same path, or would you? Um, that that's a tricky one. I I guess yeah. For now, he's he's four. He hasn't shown a, a huge interest in it yet. And and if he doesn't, I, I wouldn't push him down that path. Um, but you know, if if he picks up the racket and and wants to play and and, and is enjoying it, then yeah, I'll, I'll support him as best I can. Yeah, because I guess it's always a very tricky question for tennis players. They always kind of juggle with the with the idea of letting their children play or not. Yeah, it's, it's it's a tricky one because I think you you know you kind of know how hard the journey is and, and just what it takes and I guess you know what they're getting themselves in for. Whereas you know if 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 I was a parent and and hadn't kind of yeah had a, had a child that had gone along that journey, you you probably don't know maybe potentially how how hard it is and just what you're going to have to give up to to get there and and kind of knowing what you're getting yourself into at the, at the beginning. You know, I guess it makes it a more daunting kind of <laughs> daunting place to start from, but. He's going to have good genes with myself yeah, and Marta, yeah, so we'll, we'll see. But. But do you think it would be easier for you to actually guide him in the case that you would like tennis? Because you've been through all of that before. Um, in some ways, yeah, I guess tennis is, is going to change in, in the next 15, 20 years by the time he's he's my age as well. So, you know, um, I think, again, it's kind of similar to, to my mom who had a pretty good knowledge of tennis as well. I'm sure it will probably help him in some ways, but then he'll probably tell me to, you know, to shut up and <laughs> he doesn't want to listen to me at some point as well. So, yeah. yeah. He, he would have to have his own personality as well. Yeah, right? he's already got that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> good. And um, so you decided tennis was not the career you wanted to have anymore. And you took a break, but then you came back to it in 2017, right? Yep. What made you make that decision, let's say? Um, I think when I first stopped, I kind of completely switched off from tennis. I barely picked up a racket for probably six months to a year when, when I stopped. And then I kind of realized that, that actually... I was enjoying playing tennis again when I played stuff like, you know, County Week or mm. National Club League, things like that. I was really enjoying, yeah, just, just playing tennis. And then, so I guess I kind of got a little bit confused in my head that actually if, you know, if, if tennis isn't that bad, then, you know, may, maybe it is worth just kind of <laughs> seeing, you know, seeing where, where things are at. And I actually played fairly well, but I think I pretty quickly realized that it maybe wasn't the, the tennis itself that, that was kind of the, the, the driving force for me stopping the first time. It was more everything that kind of came with it. Um, and, and that side of things was never going to change. And, and kind okay. of, yeah, I realized that 
yeah, I, I still don't like those bits any much as I did the, the time before. So, but the yeah. bits being again traveling and organizing and not being sure of anything. Or... Yeah, but yeah, pretty much exactly that. But uh, do you still play? I mean, you've still played some matches, some county matches, right? Even after that. Yeah, yeah. So I, I still play. So... Yeah, I still play county whenever I can, and and uh, also NCL and stuff like that. But that's kind of the, the maybe next the, the year. Limits. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Next year yeah. with us, hopefully. For sure. Yeah, we, we, we did well for, for a few years. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it last year because it was smack bang in the middle of when I was moving house. But the, the few years before that, we did pretty well. And mm -hmm. so kind of still chasing that elusive Div 1 title. We'll get there at some point. Uh, what is your, let's say, memory about the playing County 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 Cup? Do you have any like, nice yeah. stories or funny stories or something that you remember? Um, I think one of the best ones was uh, under 18. I think I was probably seven, 16, 17 at the time. So I think I was maybe what one year young, under 18. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had a um, we had a good team and we ended up winning Div 1. And I think I maybe won one of the last matches on the last day to to, mm -hmm. to clinch it. And there was, yeah, loads of people on the balcony. I think it was in Bath. Mm -hmm. um, and there was there was loads of people on the balcony. And we had a pretty pretty vocal team. So, yeah, that was one of my... Uh, one of my more fond memories of tennis that was for sure would you say that this would maybe be an option uh playing county matches let's say for someone that doesn't necessarily want to play say futures and just go above that is this a good option to still kind of be able to enjoy tennis still and not give it up but still feel that competitive side is oh it... absolutely for sure i mean it, it's definitely competitive and i think the one of the best parts about it is it's it's a team environment which you don't get enough of in tennis and in, in my opinion i think it's a very you know solitary sport and you're on your own quite a bit so to be able to be a part of a team is, is something that i always really enjoyed and it's something that's quite unique for tennis and yeah certainly you know having you know not just out there fighting for yourself but you're fighting for for some other some other guys on your team that's that's uh, yeah, do you think if there were more opportunities to play team tennis you would have continued playing for longer at that level, maybe if there was something close to that level that you could have played? Um, potentially, yeah. I mean, I guess tennis is by itself quite a solitary sport, and that was one of the things that I really didn't like about it. So, you know, mm -hmm. being part of a team, maybe that that would have changed it a little bit. I mean, that did kind of always feel, when, when I was training at, um, at, at NTC, there was quite a good sort of like team spirit there. There was quite a few guys sort of my age, um, who who all used to train together and would travel together quite a bit. So there was a an element of that, but you know, ultimately, if you play them in a tournament, that that team team yeah. element goes out the window pretty quick. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's a difficult one to say, really. But definitely, if if there were more, more if there were more team events, I would have been the first to put my hand up to play them. And um, you're still watching some tennis, I'm guessing, and you've been watching watching it in the last years. Um, do you see any changes from when you used to play, like in terms of game style and just the type of tennis player that you see now compared to what we would have seen when you used to play? I don't think there's been a huge amount of change over the last kind of 10 years. I think the 10 years before that was, was quite a big change and it definitely became a more physical sport. Um, I think the days of, of guys breaking through when they're 17, 18, 19 are, are, are gone. Although mm -hmm. I guess some some guys recently, I guess, have, have, have broken yeah. through a little bit younger again. But, I, I, you know, I think they're more kind of exceptions to the rule. I, I think, you know, over the last sort of 20 years, it's become a much more physical sport. And that just kind of means that it, it takes longer and you have to be more physically developed and mentally developed to, mm -hmm. to kind of achieve results. Who do you see from the new generation taking the place of Djokovic and Federer and Nadal? Um, it's, a, it's a tricky one, really. I don't. I, I, that, that's. Or do you think that's a, they're very big? Happen? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure it will. I don't think you'll ever kind of see a dominance for that long um, mm -hmm. as those guys have had, and to still be doing it. At, I mean, I, I remember watching Federer play Wimbledon when I was eight or seven, I think, when he beat Sampras that time. 
and for the fact that he's still doing it now yeah. and I've kind of done yeah feel You've like I've him. lived a long You're life, life yeah, yeah yeah and he's still there and I've kind of yeah grown up with tennis and then played tennis and then retired from tennis mm-hmm. and then he's still going it's 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 it's, yeah, it's it's crazy and I'm not sure that'll ever happen again to be honest I think those guys are complete freaks and how good they are um I think probably Medvedev is maybe the one that stands out for me as as possibly being the one who could come closest to that kind of dominance I think he has a very big kind of powerful game but he also moves yeah. well he doesn't um, have many fans though in terms of his uh, game style <laughs> no I guess he's a bit ro- not robotic but you know he, he's kind of quite brutal in his tennis it's not as aesthetically pleasing maybe as a, a Federer and Federer, yeah. or well, to, uh, I guess maybe Nadal and, and Djokovic are not as gracious as Federer but yeah, I think that he probably doesn't have the same uh, aesthetic pull, but he, he wins. Works. He wins matches, so yeah, it works. <laughs> yeah. That's that's what counts. But why do you think we won't see that dominance anymore? I don't know. I, I mean, I think it's partly just down to how good those guys are. Whether you'll get three people who are so or four, because I mean, Murray to win as much as he did yeah, true. Uh, over an era like that is, is also pretty, pretty phenomenal. And I think that had those guys not been around, he, he could have easily equaled what, what yeah. they've done. Yeah. Um, so, I, yeah, I think just how good they are and the fact that they've come along at the same time, I think that's, that's unlikely to happen again. Which one of the four is your favorite? Uh, probably Federer. I think he's just makes it look so easy. Um, and he's kind of, whenever you watch him, he does something different. He will play some other different type of shot, whether it's his, whatever, the Sabres or whatever they were called. So, you know, something like that. He's just constantly kind of innovating and, you know, he's, he's yeah, he's, he constantly has you on the edge of your seat. Mm-hmm. Have you been, so you've played at big tournaments and you've probably seen a lot of these players that we actually watch on TV all the time, right? Um, when you see top players, let's say even in practice, because I'm guessing that has happened, is there something that stands out? You look at them and you kind of realize, yeah, okay, that's why they're, I don't know, top 10 or top five or number one. I think it's kind of the, particularly with those guys, it's just a lack of a weakness that, that kind of stands out more than anything. I mean, it, I remember kind of, I did a preseason with, with Murray once and we would mm-hmm. play like quite a few sets. And I just remember, I mean, the courts were quite slow and you'd have to do so much to win a point. He would just wouldn't give you any free points. And so to then think, oh, my God, I've got to do this four or five times to win this game. Then I'd have to do that for probably, you know, 12 games to win a set. And then if mm-hmm. I wanted to do that for, for five sets, I've got to be out here for another three hours playing that one point that I've just played to win, mm-hmm. you know, to, to win one. And, and I was kind of, yeah, that, that was really sort of tough mentally to take at the beginning of the set where you're kind of knackered after three games, played three phenomenal games and you're True. three love down. <laughs> and you think, oh, my goodness, you know, this is, this is tough. But, just the just the thought of it it tires you out in a kind of yeah just the the relentlessness of it just every single point I mean it's just like no freebies I think you look at how many like unforced errors Djokovic makes over the course of a match and you know yeah it's it's yeah it's it's incredible but what let's say in a match or in a set with Andy or against Andy let's say um you know you realize you have to keep doing that for like two or three sets in a row but was there any moment where you you thought like okay I can do this and it might work and what was it what how did you counter that um against those guys I didn't really feel like there was anything I could do to be honest um I think when you're playing you know guys who are slightly below that even let's say I um you know someone who's sort of 10 15 in the world you get and depending on the conditions whatever you can start to kind of figure out you know chinks in their game a a little bit to some extent I think with those for those top guys they just don't have them and I think that's why they have so few off days and there's so few shock results because it is just so hard to beat them I think they they just they have they have everything and and, then you know mentally as well you know to 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 do that like they do seven days you know set seven matches in in 14 days a a grand slam is is another feat in itself as well do you think that's something that you work very hard for or how how do you think they get to that stage, let's say, where, like, for example, they have no weakness? Is it a lot of training or what is it? Um, well, I guess, 
yeah, some somewhere they, they they do have some weaknesses. They're just really really hard to find, and uh, I think that they're they're also quite good at protecting those as well. I guess um, during matches, and they know how to you know probably Federer, let's say, doesn't like a, a high backhand too much, but he'll make sure you can't hit the ball high to his backhand very often. Um, and I think they just kind of have the that perfect sort of yeah freak scenario where they have everything they're mentally good they're physically good their their tennis hand skills are, are phenomenal as well um and i think they're kind of yeah sort of one, once in a generation once in a lifetime sort of type of player when you used to play was there one player or let's say a few players that you absolutely hated playing against they were your nemesis and you know and um, <laughs> Uh, I I always hated playing like really tall players with like massive serves, but not much else, because mm-hmm. um, concentration was never, I guess, my my, my strong point. And I'd, I'd always kind of get frustrated where you'd go like sort of three four minutes without touching a ball, and then you had to be so on it with your service game, otherwise mm-hmm. you got broken, and that was it. You lost the set. Um, and so I'd, I'd always kind of struggle with with those sort of matches just because you couldn't get into any rhythm whatsoever. I remember there was a, a guy never got a particularly great rank. I think he got sort of like maybe two, three hundred. A good German mm-hmm. guy called Richard Becker, who I played like three or four times in a year. And he he was pretty much that. He was six foot eight with a massive serve and, and nothing else. And I think I lost to him like yeah, four or five times in, in one year once. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, what would you say your game style was? Who would you uh, identify with, let's say, from these, let's say maybe top ten, who would you say you, you'd compare yourself with? Um, nowadays I, I don't really know, but certainly when I, when I was growing up and when I just sort of first was, was starting to play futures and stuff like that, it was always Robin Sodling. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was fortunate enough to kind of practice with him a, a few times when I was sort of 16, 17, um, and always kind of, yeah, tried to model my game as much as I could on him. I think I hit the ball pretty big, um, off the baseline and always would try to kind of, assert my game onto other people so yeah that was that was kind of my idol when you this would be a question let's say for even for younger players for juniors that they let's say they step on a court and maybe they're playing uh seed one they have top seed and um they're panicking i don't know so let's say it would be a situation where you play against andy or Soderling. how do you cope with that how do you forget about who's on the other side of the net? And how do you, yeah. Oh, yeah I think you have to focus on your own game and, and kind of, yeah, focus on, on your strengths rather than theirs and think, okay, if I'm going to have a chance here, what have I got to do well to, to win this match? Is it where I'm going to have to serve well? Or, and, and kind of give yourself small, small targets mm-hmm. within that match of things that you know that you can kind of control yourself. So it's not, you know, not thinking, oh God, you know, he's, he's serving really well or whatever, but you, you know, you can't control that. So I think, and this is ironically something I probably wasn't that good at when I played, but it's kind of keeping that, that context of, okay, well, you know, I, I can't control what he's doing. If, if he's, you know, serving me off the court, then I've just got to concentrate on, on my server, winning my service games. Um, and yeah, so kind of breaking that down into to small chunks and, and obvious things that, that you can do to influence the match. Mm-hmm. And let's see, you're, you're, um, You've played the final, you finished the final of the Junior US Open and you win. What what do you feel then? What goes through your head? Um almost like relief as much as anything, which which sounds a bit odd, but it was just particularly that day it was, was such a big match uh, for, for me personally that I'd kind of yeah, didn't sleep very well the night before didn't wasn't really you know hungry that morning because you get pretty being climax at the end and I almost say I had like a a few match points earlier in the match like a couple of games earlier and didn't take them Um, and so I think yeah it was just literally pure relief I think when, when I ended up winning. Did you realize soon after what you have done or did it take a while? It, it took a while. I got chosen for like um, to to do a drug test afterwards, so I had to sit in like the drug test room for about two hours after, which which wasn't ideal. Um, but I think the kind of the moment I got back to my room and I 
just sort of like crashed on the bed and just put the trophy down on the table <laughs> next to the TV and just sort of looked at it and went, oh, <laughs> yeah, that, 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 this really has just happened. I think that was kind of a, a moment where it dawned on me. And what does it do to you as a tennis player? And let's say mentally speaking, the fact that you've just won that, like in terms of going forwards, like do you feel any pressure or what's what's happening? Yeah, I think there was definitely an element of pressure that came with that and an element of expectation. Um, it, it got put to me quite a few times that the last person to, to win the, the juniors at the US was, was Andy. I think it was maybe 10, 10 years before. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think everyone just kind of naturally expected me to, to follow in his footsteps. And, uh, you know, I think he, he's an exceptional talent as well. And so that was always going to be a, a tough ask, I think it also kind of puts a target on you a little bit. So when you're going to play futures and stuff like that, there's guys who've been, you know, playing them for, for 10, 15 years and they kind of think, oh, you know, I want to show this guy that he's he's really not that good. And they maybe have that extra little bit of incentive to beat you as well. So that, yeah, that was, mm -hmm. that was something which was, which was tough to overcome. Was that when you think, like, let's say after that, do you think that's when you started maybe to not enjoy playing that much because um, of those expectations or it probably didn't help um, I think a lot of people then kind of had a yeah more of a, a vested interest in me and, and maybe started to I guess judge my decisions a little bit more I think mm -hmm. that in terms of my personal enjoyment for it it, it it would kind of already started to go before that if I'm being honest um, I think that kind of probably meant that I hung in there bit longer than I probably would have done otherwise um, I had kind of considered going down the, the American college route and stuff like that before um, US came along um, and hadn't had a particularly great year actually up until that point and kind of the, the few months before that was yeah really kind of assessing my options a little bit and and I guess that's maybe partly down to why I played so well that week as well because I had kind of less expectation on myself personally I wasn't really expecting to do that much so I hadn't come into it with, with great preparation and so probably was a lot more relaxed which evidently helped okay yeah it just didn't help after no okay. yeah but what would you what would Ollie now say to Ollie after finish after winning the US Open and just maybe even when you decided tennis is not for you anymore, what would be the advice that you would give yourself? I'd probably try and enjoy it a bit more. I mean, I literally every time I won a match, I'd kind of have that sort of relief feeling where you don't really enjoy it. Um, and equally, when I lost the match, it was the end of the world. I mean, I've always been incredibly competitive at whatever I do, whether it's playing tennis, playing Monopoly, whatever it is, I absolutely hate losing. And so if I lost, I'd, I'd take it pretty badly. Um, and so, yeah, just to kind of in, in, enjoy the journey. And, and also, I mean, one of my kind of biggest regrets is when I was traveling a lot, I, I didn't really like it that much. And it's probably because I got so wrapped up in, in what I was doing and wasn't able to go and enjoy where I was a little bit more. And I wish I'd kind of, you know, you can't dedicate too much time. So ultimately you're not there for, yeah. to be a tourist. You're there to, to play tennis and, and you're doing a job, so to speak. Um, but I wish I'd kind of taken a bit more time to, yeah, to, to see where I was, the, the, some of the places that I've been. What do you wish someone else had told you at that point? Maybe your parents, maybe your coach or your coaches. Or, yeah, what advice do you think would have, would have helped you then to keep going or even to enjoy it more? Um, yeah, maybe that. I think it's, you know, kind of enjoy it. And I think the, the psychological side of things, I probably... And, and, and it, this is not through lack of trying. People, you know, did kind of push me down that route as well. But it was just never something that I really embraced. And I think it's such a big part of, of tennis. And I probably, you know, didn't realize that at, at the time. I think by the time I played the, the couple of tournaments the second time around, I think that was, fair, you know, uh, mentally I was in a very different place there and probably understood that side of things a lot better. But it was definitely mm -hmm. something that... You know, at 17, 18, 19, I was kind of quite young to the world and, and naive. And, and like I say, every single match would, would be the end of the world if I lost it. Whereas I think keeping that perspective that, OK, well, you know, I lost today, but this is a long journey. This is a long process. Mm -hmm. um, 
it does definitely does matter to lose, but you know, not not as much as probably I, I thought it thought it did at the time. Um, and I think that kind of transferred into how I would behave on the court, and, and, and you know, and how frustrated I would get sometimes, um, and, and kind of yeah, being able to take a step back when you're on the court and think, well, there's two people here. If you're not particularly happy about the conditions in your game, the umpire, whatever. So there's a fair chance the other guy on, on the other side of the court is feeling the same. Whereas for me, I'd just be so wrapped up in, in what I was doing that I'd yeah, let it spiral sometimes. Did you feel at one point that you maybe were running out of time to prove something or to do even, you know, to step up even more? Yeah, and, and, and that was kind of the, I guess, the rhetoric that was pushed a little bit at, at the time by people who, okay. who were around me. It was kind of like... You know, by 20 years old, Murray was at, at this point. Or, you know, there's a stat where if you're not in the top 100 by the time you're 20 years and seven months, then, you know, the chances of you making it are far less. And and so were, those were things that were definitely, you know, put to me rightly or wrongly. In, you know, some people, I guess, they that motivates them. Other people, it kind of panics them a little bit. I think it would probably yeah more more in the in the second category there and and you know those were things that would go through my head in the, in the middle of a match that okay well if I win this match I'm going to go to x ranking and I'm going to get x amount of points when when actually you know by thinking that and, and even knowing that I you know wasn't it definitely wasn't helping um I think yeah when I kind of played those few tournaments the second time I, I don't think I ever looked at a ranking of where I'd end up once and and I think that if you if you have the ability to do that not everybody does but if you have the ability to be able to play like that I think it definitely makes a difference yeah I was asking because I think we're roughly the same age and I remember the time when I was uh, maybe 15 I think Sharapova was maybe 17 or 18 she was very young and she was like winning you know slams and stuff like that and you kind of feel this taking bomb in a way like times going away and you don't have any time left to prove yourself so that's why i was asking if you felt like you were time pressured oh no for, for sure yeah de definitely um and i think that's so yeah something which is kind of completely unnecessary i think everybody has their their own journey as to where they're going to end up at and you know, I think even more so nowadays, there's more mm -hmm. and more people who break through so much older. I think yeah. there was, I always remember a guy called Victor Estrella, mm -hmm. um, who I think maybe broke the top 100 at like 34 or 35 right. and, and had kind of constantly been around sort of three, four, five hundred 500 for 15 years. And then suddenly kind of had that, yeah, that, that moment where it all clicked. And I think, you know, you never kind of know when that's going to happen. There's, there's always next week in tennis. It might, it might start next week, you know, you, you don't know. And so, yeah, I think you have to kind of keep that perspective that, you know, if it's not happening for you today, it, it still might happen tomorrow. It doesn't mean it's never going to happen. So would you, let's say from a coaching perspective, because you've done that uh, a fair bit, right? Would you encourage someone to keep going if they actually enjoy doing it, even if, they're not getting the results that they want necessarily at that moment. Yeah, for, for sure. And, and it sounds like a bit of a kind of cliche, but it is very much about the process and it's about trying to put those tools in place. And, you know, it depends, I guess, what, what stage you're at in, in the journey and, and how old you are. But, you know, it, it is particularly at sort of like a teenage sort of age. It's, it's about putting those blocks in place so that when you do reach kind of maturity, you have all those tools at your disposal to be able to be a good tennis player. It's not necessarily, a, you know, about winning at, at, at that age. Um, and, and although, you know, myself included, I absolutely hated losing. So it was always about yeah. winning for me, yeah. you know, in the grand scheme of things, it, it isn't. It's, it's a long journey and it, it, it takes a long, a long time to, to, to end up where you want to be. So if you kind of try and, and, and rush that, it, it's, it's not going to yeah. work. And I guess we kind of have different expectations from tennis players in a way than from people in like real life because everyone matures differently. But at the same time, we expect tennis players to kind of mature at the same time and have results at this, around the same age and whatever. Yeah, so. Well, for sure. I mean, you, you know, you're expected to be old or be on your years, you know, at 17, 18, 19, 20, or you're under the microscope. And, and, you know, there's people judging not just what you do on a tennis court, but, but every moment of your life. And so you, you, you do come under that, that increased scrutiny, I guess, you know, whether, whether it's, 
the LTA putting that on you or whether it's yourself putting that on you or, what, you know, whoever that is around you, you know, that, that definitely kind of, yeah, you, you're definitely under that microscope. Where did you feel the pressure coming from, for example? Um, probably my, myself, first and foremost. I mean, you know, I, I was always kind of, yeah, I guess my, my own harshest critic in some ways, certainly when it came to winning and losing, not necessarily when it came to, I guess, yeah, the, the way I trained, where it was always about the, the match for me, and mm -hmm. not so much about the kind of, yeah, I never particularly liked going in the gym and stuff like that. And so, you know, I, that that was maybe somewhere where I could have been hard on myself, but certainly, in, yeah, in terms of playing matches, I guess, I think, yeah, I've put enough pressure on myself as much as there was pressure definitely from, from other people. Um, who were investing, you know, time and, and money and effort into my career, I think, yeah, it was definitely myself. Would you think, like, yeah, kind of making a parallel a little bit, uh, do you think Zverev might be going through the same pressure kind of moment or period in his life? Because he's had really good results <laughs> and then people had these great expectations from him and now it's looking like he's struggling a little bit. Yeah, I guess in context, take, he's, yeah. he's struggling a little bit, but he's still well, what, yeah, like, top, for, top for 10, him, top 20 in the him. world. So yeah, by, by his own standards. Um, but I think the person who always stood out for me was 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 Kyrgios. I think he had that, that massive expectation on, on him. Um, and I think he, so much of the reason why he, he has, I guess, not fulfilled his promise to a certain extent mm -hmm. um, is because I think, you know, he hasn't matured maybe as quickly as other people. Um, and I think when you put that into the context of a tennis player, that's probably true. But if you put that into the context of your average 23, 24 year old, he's probably fairly mature for his age. Um, and, and yeah, so I think in terms of Sparov, is he, is he going through that stage? Probably a little bit. I mean, he's still pretty young, right? I mean, he's, uh, I'm not sure how old he is off the top of my head, but yeah, 22, 23. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it, I guess not that long ago that I was 22, 23 and the way that you look at the world there it's, there's still a, a whole lot to learn so I'm sure he's probably going through that and you know he's, he, he, he'll come out the other side I'm sure mm -hmm. at some point what, what do you think of Kyrgios as t a tennis player? Do you like his style? Do you not? Yeah well he, he does different things right so I've, I've always kind of liked that I'd, I'd, although I guess I was quite monotonous as a player myself I was never someone who would kind of yes yeah, slice and volley and, and come to the net and stuff like that I was yeah more someone who just repeatedly crunched the ball from the base and I think he, he does have that variety and, and I guess because that's something he, I, I was never that good at I always admired it more I think in terms of yeah being able to play all the, the, the trick shots and, and just mm -hmm. I think yeah he, he always Although maybe he doesn't, yeah, give it off that much. I think I think he he doesn't enjoy the kind of the the, the showmanship of it, and mm -hmm. just yeah enjoys playing to the crowd a bit. Let's say you would um, you'd have to play against him. What would be your first thought going on court, knowing you would play, you will play against him? Uh, now I'd probably try and wind him up, or probably tell, okay. you know, you would probably <laughs> tell him that something's that. going on that, that that's not going on because you know I, I, I used to kind of yeah, go a bit a bit nuts like he would on the court as well. So and I think he's definitely got a trigger there that if you can <laughs> if you can get it to go off, his his game would would probably mm -hmm. fall apart uh, a little bit. So yeah, that might be a bit sneaky, but that's probably <laughs> probably what I do. Okay. Good tactic. I mean, he does wind people up. Yeah, he, he goes the other way, I guess, yeah. as well. So. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, just like random question. What do you think about the underarm serve? What is your take on that? Because there, there are a lot of opinions about it, but... Uh, well, it's within the laws, right? So <laughs> why, why, why wouldn't you do it? What would you think about it as a player from, you know, standing on the opposite side of the, the net? On the other uh, side? Yeah, I'd pr pr probably, I think it's quite... It can come across as quite disrespectful. I think it massively depends on on the context of of the match. If it's one of those matches where things are a little bit nasty and are sort of simmering on the edge, then you know you, you can definitely take it the wrong way, and it can come across quite badly. If it's kind of quite a, a, a relaxed match where both guys are enjoying it, then I, I guess it's probably a bit different. But I know I've, I've had it done to me before, and I'm not reacted <laughs> not reacted pretty well. So, have you done it? 
Uh, yeah, I don't think I ever have actually. Not yeah. not in a not in a I guess professional match. Okay. No. Okay. And uh, talking about expectations a little bit, let's say people usually expect and um, from players that have won junior Grand Slams to do the same thing going forwards, yeah, and win the win the big slams. But let's say quite often it doesn't happen that way. Why do you think it doesn't happen? And what actually takes for someone to go from that junior level to the higher level? Where's the gap? What's happening? I think, yeah, it's, it, it's a big gap. And there's so many different reasons maybe why people win junior grand slams, for example, that just don't transfer on to the, the senior game. I mean, it, it's almost a different sport entirely. Um, and, and there's, you know, the, the pressure and the expectation is very different when you get into the adult game and, uh, as a junior. It, maybe it is there, but if it is there, you don't realise it as much. It, it's still, you're still kind of quite young and don't really understand how the world works that much. And, and I guess, so the, 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 there's two elements to that as well, because I think that there are maybe guys at that age who do realise that. And sometimes they do well when maybe they're not the best tennis player, but then, you know, that they, they, mm-hmm. so they, they kind of, yeah, beat the guys who are less mature um but that maybe means that they're not as good in the in the long run um i think yeah there's and then there's maybe the the, the flip side of people who are pretty good but then kind of yeah take longer to develop when you get into the senior game and you know the, the weight of that expectation i guess becomes too much and and they just kind of fall by the wayside so uh, yeah it's difficult really to to pinpoint one thing but but i think that patience once you come out of juniors even if you have had a successful career you know First of all, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a given that you're going to replicate the same thing in, in the adults. And second of all, if it, if it does, it's going to take time. And, and I think kind of setting those expectations for yourself that, you know, this is still going to be another 10 years before I hit my peak, I think is quite important. Okay. What did you mean by, by being a different sport? In what way? I think it's, you can kind of you can win at a junior level or win certainly tournaments that big with kind of holes in your game or weaknesses, I think. And that kind of comes, I guess, onto what we were saying earlier, that those, those top guys just, just don't have them. Um, So I think, you know, you can win a junior grand slam without being the best mentally or physically, or maybe, you know, really good mentally, physically, but you, you don't quite have, you know, you're, you're not the most amazing, naturally talented player. Um, I think to win a, a senior grand slam that's it's very different and particularly the the physical element i mean just purely the you know the fact that it's it's five sets is is, mm-hmm. is a big difference um and and being able to do that seven times in in two weeks to you know play a match for four or five hours is a lot different than, mm-hmm. than playing i guess five six matches that are an hour yeah. an hour and a half long so i think you know the, the physical element is is hugely different and the mental element as well um and, mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess all, all, every, every kind of element of it is, is just, yeah, it's kind of on, on steroids as such. It's just so much harder. On, um, at the, after winning, or let's say at the time of winning uh, the US Open for you, what were your strengths and what were your flaws, let's say? Um, I was, yeah, so I guess I always struck the ball quite well, kind of uh, from the baseline. I, I didn't miss much and, and could kind of yeah get a, get a lot of free points. Um, and I guess I served fairly well for for my age uh, at that point. I think mentally and physically, I, I wasn't great, and and that was always the side of things that maybe even in, in seniors was kind of my not sorry my downfall, but certainly not my strength. Um, uh, and I think yeah, I kind of relied a lot on. on my ball strike and, and being able to just hit through and hit, hit harder than a lot of the guys I was playing against. Do you, do you believe, let's say, in having a certain game and sticking to it maybe a very big chunk of your career? Or do you think it can be changed and that you need to be a bit more you know, complex and complete as a player? Especially think, now, I think. yeah, I, th- I think you always have that that game style, right? That that identity, and I think mm-hmm. it's just kind of yeah, honing that and, and fine tuning it as you as you kind of get older. 
I think it comes kind of back to the age old debate. Do you, do you try and make your strengths even better or do you focus on your weaknesses and try and get them sort of closer to, your, to, to become strengths? I think a, a lot of when I moved out of, of juniors into seniors, I spent a lot of time focusing on what my weaknesses were. I spent a lot of time mm. in, in the gym. I spent a lot of time trying to work on like my hand skills, slice coming forward a lot more. Um, and particularly in, in, in terms of that kind of tactical side of coming forward a lot more, that was never really my game. And, and so uh, could I have kind of focused a little bit more on, on just yeah working on my strengths rather than my weaknesses I think that would have maybe been a, a, a better strategy at the time and certainly probably would have yielded more short-term results mm -hmm. I think at my coaches at the time were thinking a lot more long-term which is also understandable in terms of building my game for the future I guess as it turned out there wasn't so much of a long term <laughs> um, but uh, yeah I think it's, it's kind of a, a combination of both but but certainly trying to, to build that identity and, and know exactly where your strengths lie is, is very important. Mm -hmm. Well, what was your biggest shock going from juniors to sen more seniors? Yeah. Um, I'd say both, both my forehand and my backhand were, yeah, my, my huge strengths. They each kind of had their own sort of attributes, I guess. My backhand was, was very solid. I, did, I you know, would, would never miss off my backhand. Probably didn't do as much damage. My forehand could be very big on its day, but also could have its off day where, <laughs> where things could go a bit wrong. And and what was the biggest shock you had going through that from one stage to another, from junior tournaments to senior tournaments? I think at juniors, I was good enough to get away with a lapse of concentration here and there. Mm -hmm. um, seniors, you, you just you can't do that. And then that kind of gets heightened as you go through seniors as well. I think in futures, I was probably still good enough in, in some matches to you know, play a couple of sloppy games here, give my serve away and then be, you know, be able to break back and, and come back and win sets. I think mm -hmm. once you start getting, getting into challenges and, and, and tour levels, you know, you, if you, if you check out for five minutes, that's it, you've lost the set, it's gone. And, and no matter how well you play after that, you, you know, there's, there's a fair chance you're not going to get another opportunity. So I think that was the, the biggest element of kind of, yeah, a wake up call was that I couldn't have those lapses in, in concentration, which is something I never really got over with, to be honest. I, I think <laughs> my concentration was, was always pretty bad. And let's say going, what could parents, coaches, governing bodies, people that support tennis players, what could they do to help the, this transition from being a junior to playing senior tournaments? Uh, I think just keeping keeping that perspective and and remembering you know sometimes that the kids are kids as well they're gonna, you know, you're gonna have off days still and and it's not gonna it's not gonna maybe happen as quick as you'd like it to but you know keep remembering that that this is a journey that's gonna go on and hopefully until you're kind of thirty and there's a there's a long way to go and and so well, you, you know it's it's really tempting to get wrapped up in why things are not working now or why things are working and and kind of really focusing on that remembering that you know it, it, it's a long journey and you've got to be kind to yourself because otherwise you get to a point where you know you, you just don't yeah don't want to do it anymore so i think that's that's quite important and let's talk a little bit about some happy memories of tennis like of actually playing tournaments traveling but you know, for it be, to be a happy memory, something you enjoyed? Uh, yeah, playing Wimbledon. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough to play it a few times as, as a junior um, and then kind of, yeah, coming back and I think in 2012, um, I, I played the main draw and, and kind of, yeah, walking out there, that was really kind of a moment where it was like, okay, well, this, this has all been worth it, mm -hmm. <laughs> this whole journey and, and kind of, yeah, that that was really yeah, a moment that, that sticks out for me. I think also um, I won a, a gold medal at the Youth Olympics in Singapore, mm -hmm. um, and that was that was kind of I guess my yeah, my, my second best moment I think um, because it, it was winning for your country as much as for yourself um, and kind of yeah stamps and you know, the anthem and things like that and coming home on the plane with the gold medal was was really cool. Was that bigger and? Uh, more enjoyable for you for example than actually playing a slam because it's so different or it was just very yeah it was just very a, a kind of different experience and we were part of a team there and stuff which again something we mentioned earlier it's a very different dynamic 
and uh, you know you'd come back to the, the little village thing after and everyone would be talking about what what they did in, in their sport that day and things like that rather than coming back to a hotel for the tennis players in, in the middle of nowhere it was it was a very different kind of experience um, and, and having you know 10 15 guys uh, from from different sports in the stand cheering you on for, for every match was was really cool will you be playing um, senior ITFs Oh, I've not really thought about that yet. I'm going to say probably not. I think, uh, yeah, I think my kind of really competitive days of traveling for tennis and all that are, are, are over. I can't imagine that kind of when I'm in my, yeah, my, my 30s and my mm -hmm. 40s, I'll have a huge appetite for that, but never say never. But never definitely know. sticking to county week. Then. Yeah, county week for sure. We've okay. got to win Div 1 at some point. Good, good. Okay, I think we're gonna uh, try and finish with a round of quick fire questions. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, number one strength as a player. Uh, forehand. Pick a doubles partner. Uh, Federer. Favorite film. Uh, Snatch. Song you have on repeat now, or podcast, or playlist? Uh, Guardian Football Weekly. It's a podcast. Uh, summer or Christmas? Christmas. Chris, favorite Christmas song? Uh, it's, I'm not I'm sure it's a Christmas song, but it's like Spaceman Came Traveling, I think it's called, or okay. Spaceman by Chris Christopher, or what? Yeah, that, that one. Okay. Night in or night out? Night in. Phone call or text? Uh, text. Country you'd move to? Costa Rica. Bit of an odd one, but I went there on holiday last year and absolutely loved it. Nice. Marmite or Brussels sprouts? Marmite, definitely. Really? Yeah, I love Marmite. Oh, wow, this is a shocker. You're the first person that actually <laughs> shows Marmite. Oh, no, yeah, love, love it. Brussels Can't get enough of it. Really? Yeah, yeah. Yes, finally found that one person. <laughs> I'm that weirdo who, who <laughs> likes the man like. Really, I think you're like the eight, maybe eighth or ninth person that I've spoken to, and you're the first one that chose Marmite. There we go. Good, good. This is yeah, that's good. Well, thank you very much for doing this. It was really nice to meet you and no worries, uh, no find all that out, and just from that perspective, from your perspective. And hopefully I'll see you soon playing some county cup matches. Absolutely. Yeah, hopefully. I look forward to that next year. Hopefully everything will be back to normality and uh, we, can, we can get back to yeah. Dublin. Thank you. No Thanks worries. Cheers. And yeah, bye. Bye. bye.